Well, we continue in worship today by going to God's Word in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be doing just a couple verses, 10 through 12, and it'll be on the screen behind me. Let's listen to the Lord this morning. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Let's pray. Lord, we continue to thank you for your word. We thank you that in it there is life. We thank you that you show us exactly who you are. And Lord, I pray that you would have prepared our hearts throughout this whole week to hear your word. Spirit, would you illuminate our hearts today? Would you train us in righteousness? And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, I just want to join with the, the, my voice with the others and say thank you to our veterans. We truly are grateful for your service. And, um, you know, our, our veterans are tough people, strong people, and um, they're, they're under assault. If, you've, if you're not aware of the statistics on veterans and, uh, and suicide and despair and homelessness and a number of other issues, they're, they're in a very difficult way and they need our prayers and our, our support. Um, I want to talk about another type of strong person, and that is um, back in the 1990s, Sports Illustrated did a little expose on a champion arm wrestler. And this guy, David Patton was his name, he was not who you would expect to be a, an arm wrestler. He was about 5 foot 10, 160 pounds, not particularly big, but at the time of writing, he had gone more than 12 years without losing an arm wrestling match. In high school, he challenged a defensive lineman from the Washington Redskins to an arm wrestling match, which ended up with him getting beat up rather than losing the arm wrestling match, but uh, a very strong man. He was diligent about his training. He used to be very precise with it. He liked to do precisely 756 bicep curls, pushing his muscles to the, the very brink of exhaustion. He was strategic in his training. He, he felt like a lot, most other arm wrestlers were working on you know, the biceps and those kinds of things, but he focused his training on the ligaments and the tendons and the things around the muscles. And then his, his main point of attack was to attack those weak places that most people weren't training. Very strong guy, impressive, impressive arm wrestler, and you can watch videos of him on YouTube, and uh, it's kind of fun. Um, but in that same article in Sports Illustrated, they were talking about some other strong people as well. One of them was a guy um, uh, from Connecticut, and this guy had 18-inch forearms, which is like just a little bigger than mine, and he, you could put him in a 55-gallon drum and he could jump straight out of it without touching the sides. Just pretty impressive. And then there was this guy, a 600-pound pig farmer from Georgia named Cleve Dean. Which, if, if you only saw his name, you would guess he might be a pig farmer. That is just like a perfect pig farmer name. But this guy was so strong, he could go and take two full-size hogs under each arm, pick them up, and walk around his farm with them. He was a strong man. And then there was this guy back in the 1950s named Mac Batchelor, lived out in Los Angeles, and he could take four bottle caps, metal bottle caps, put them in between his fingers and his, and his thumb, and then crunch them all in half just by closing his fist. That's, that's strength, right? These are the kind of guys you want to have on your side at the HOA meeting when things get a little <laughs> testy, right? You want them in your corner when people start giving you a hard time and he just, just, just flexes right in front of them and everybody settles down and suddenly, you know, the plants aren't as important as we thought they were five minutes ago. These are strong people you want in a fight like that. But what happens when the enemy that you're fighting and that you have to face isn't made of flesh and blood? What happens when you're engaged in a conflict with an enemy that you can't see, that you can't touch? and yet is very much real and is very much able to do you great harm. How, do, how does one engage in that kind of a conflict? What does the kind of strength that those people have do for us in that kind of a battle? 
Because what the Apostle Paul says here in Ephesians 6 is that we are engaged in just such a conflict. Not one against flesh and blood where, where strong muscles and, and you know, bravery in the ways we think about it traditionally can be helpful to you, but we're engaged in a spiritual battle, a spiritual conflict where, where the things we traditionally rely on in the midst of conflict aren't going to do us any good. The enemy we're dealing with is known throughout the scripture as the devil or Satan, and along with him are these other spiritual beings that we typically refer to as demons. And when we engage in this conflict with them, what we sometimes call spiritual warfare, we don't have the ability to rely on traditional strength and weapons because they are not traditional enemies. They are spiritual enemies. And so what's called for in this conflict are spiritual weapons and spiritual defenses and spiritual tactics and strategies with which to engage the enemy. And so the Apostle Paul gives us encouragement in this passage as he's bringing his letter to the Ephesians to a close that we have what we need to engage in this fight that we are in, but it's not in ourselves. And so he says in Ephesians 6.10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. If you're going to stand firm in the conflict that rages around us every day, you need a strength that's not your own, but comes from the Lord. Now, the nature of this conflict, may, you, may not, you may not recognize or appreciate it when it's happening. Uh, for those of you who are kids and students who are living still with your parents, when you are tempted to dishonor or disobey your parents, you are involved in this spiritual conflict that's raging. Um, when you, anyone in the room, are tempted to pass on a rumor that would bring harm to another person, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's an enemy, you are engaging in this spiritual conflict. Uh, when we are tempted to be dishonest, we're engaged in the spiritual conflict. When we're tempted to take pride in our spiritual exercises or, or disciplines, we are engaging in this spiritual conflict. It rages around us all of the time, and we're often unaware of it. And so it's very helpful that the Apostle Paul draws our attention to the reality of the conflict, but then even more importantly, draws our attention to the weapons and the strength and the armor that's available to those who are in Jesus. So that's what we're gonna look at today. First of all, we're gonna look at the, the enemy that we face in more detail. Then we're gonna look at his schemes and what he does to try to bring us down. And then thirdly, we're gonna look at the, uh, the strength that we have to resist him. And then um, we're only gonna be able to get into this part way this week. And then next week, we're gonna continue with the theme. But let's start with the first piece of this, which is the enemy that we face. First, we have an enemy. And it's important that we recognize that and we acknowledge that. We have an enemy. We are not living in peacetime right now. We are in the midst of war. And there is a, there, there are li, uh, literal spiritual beings whose aim is to steal, kill, and destroy. And their target is you and your children and your grandchildren and to seek to reap and, um, and sow chaos uh, throughout society and death and destruction and so on. And so we're gonna jump down. We're actually gonna take this passage in reverse order. So we're gonna start at the end with verse 12. And this is what he writes there. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So I was a wrestler growing up. We'd always go to wrestling tournaments and wrestlers are always coming up with crafty t-shirts. And one of the most common t-shirts you would see as you walk around a wrestling tournament, and they might still be doing this, I don't know, would say on the back, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And as I think about this as an adult, I think to myself, Actually, you are very much wrestling with flesh and blood. That's why we're here. That's what this tournament is all about. Um, but I appreciate the effort to do something spiritual on the back of a wrestling t-shirt. But, but wrestling is actually very much about flesh and blood uh, conflict in ways that are 
you know, according to the rules and so on. But, but the, this conflict actually is not against flesh and blood. And it's important that we understand that our conflict is not with flesh and blood. Because uh, there, there are many people under the impression that Christians, for example, are at war with people who are same-sex attracted. Or that Christians are at war with people who have embraced transgender ideologies or are at war with people who are pushing and promoting abortion and so on. The reality is some Christians are at war with those people. And they shouldn't be. Because that's not the enemy. The enemy is the spiritual forces, the unseen forces in the, in the spiritual realm over this present darkness that are working in and behind uh, these people and, and, and working in and through them to be sure to bring about death and destruction, to bring about distortion and deception, to deceive people into embracing these as ways of living and being in this world that are good. And yet these things are contrary to God. This is what, this is what Satan is ultimately about. This is what he's ultimately about doing. He's about deceiving people and leading people into destruction because that's what he's here for. That's what his whole ambition is, is to, uh, to destroy the good work that God is doing. So as Christians, we have to remember the enemy is not people. It is rather these spiritual forces that we go after not with you know, human weapons and, and, and words of attack, but rather uh, the spiritual weapons that we're going to get into in more depth in the, uh, in the next week. So we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but instead against the rulers, against the powers, against the authorities, and against the, the cosmic... Pra- you, you've, you've seen the list. Now, we, we were interested in getting into more detail about what are these rulers, what are these authorities, what are these powers over the cosmic darkness and these, these spiritual forces. And the reality is the Bible does not give us a lot of information and detail about them. Uh, you can find lots of books at Christian bookstores, if you can find a Christian bookstore, that will, that will go into lots of detail about the levels and the ranks and the, um, you know, the various domains over which these different, you know, that, I don't think that's particularly helpful. Now, the Apostle Paul doesn't go into that kind of detail with us. What he does is he, make us, he makes known to us the, the uh, that there are a variety of these spiritual powers. And, well, let's look at the things we can conclude from what he says. The first thing that we can conclude by looking at this is that uh, we have an enemy, and our enemy is not one being, but many. Our enemy is not one being, but many. There is the devil, but there's not just the devil. Along with the devil, that, that ancient foe, are these, uh, these ranks or these legions, these groups of other spiritual forces that are working in conjunction with him. And the first time we see these rulers and authorities mentioned is actually back in chapter one. And it's important that we understand the context in which these rulers and authorities are mentioned. It's, it's very important. What, what Paul is talking about when he mentions them the first time is the tremendous power that's available to believers. And this is what he says in verse 20 and 21, uh, that, that, that power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So the first time this rule and authority is mentioned, it's mentioned in the context of Christ has risen victorious over all of them. He's exalted high above them all and he is not subject to them, but rather they are subject to him. So that's the first thing we have to understand. There are many, but all of them are subject to the risen Christ. He has all authority over the rulers and the authorities. Now, the second time they're mentioned is in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. And here Paul is talking about the extraordinary uh, wisdom of God that's now been revealed. And here's what he goes on to say. So that through the church... The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So God is using the church to manifest his great wisdom to these spiritual powers in the heavenly places, these, these, these spiritual authorities. The way I think about that is um, they are the object of God's derision. Uh, he is using the church to mock and taunt the rulers and authorities. 
It's a really neat role that we get to play in God's redemptive plan to show uh, by which he's demonstrating just how wise and amazing and powerful he is in the face of these enemies. It's important that we recognize that this is part of what we are here for as believers. Uh, just this, the last day, I was in, uh, made a quick trip to West Virginia to visit an aunt of mine. Her name is Robin. Some of you who went to Israel with us a couple of years ago know her. And she's in the last phases of a battle with, with cancer. And she's, she's now bedridden and, and she's under a great deal of attack. So appreciate your prayers for her if you think of her. But um, as we were talking, she shared that uh, she feels now that she's bedridden, like she doesn't have any part to play in the kingdom. And she's frustrated that she's sort of been isolated now and, and, and isn't able to engage in the conflict in the ways that she has so faithfully done for, for many years. And it was helpful to have this passage on my mind because I was able to share with her, you know, even though you're not a, a, a witness to the outside world at this point in your life, don't forget that even just here in your room alone, you are a testimony right now to these rulers and authorities. God showing his wisdom through you. As you continue to trust him and believe him and, and declare his goodness, God is mocking the spiritual powers that seek to have you. And that's true for you too. Where, wherever you are, even when you're by yourself alone, you are still part of this, this cosmic conflict and God is demonstrating through you his tremendous wisdom and his power and his might as you continue to trust him and declare his faithfulness and his goodness, even in the midst of suffering and affliction. So we have an enemy. He is not one, but he is, he is many. Secondly, our enemy has some power over this present darkness. Uh, back in, in chapter 6, uh, the, the enemy is described in one way, in verse 12, as the, the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Uh, what is this present darkness? Uh, well, he's, he's speaking about the this present age and the world as it stands opposed to God. This present darkness is the world as it is under the authority of these evil spiritual powers. There are people who are under the authority of these evil spiritual powers, this present darkness. In fact, uh, all of us in this room, if we're not currently under the power of these evil forces, we were under their power at one point. You may remember in, earlier in Ephesians uh, chapter uh, 5, Paul said that at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. All of us were once part of the rebellion against God. We were under the authority of these evil spiritual beings and forces that we were being carried along by them to do whatever they wanted us to do. You're not free apart from, from Jesus. And so what happens in this great work of salvation that we often talk about as Christians, uh, one of the ways that we can think about it is that he saves us from being under the power of these forces of darkness. Listen to how he puts it in Colossians chapter one. He says that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If God has not rescued you from darkness, then you are still in darkness today. You're still under the authority of these evil spiritual beings and I recognize that, you know, as I talk about the cosmic powers and the evil forces and so on, it sounds like a Marvel comic book or something. This is real. And we're using language that, that we can understand, but, but, you know, it doesn't totally capture the reality, but we're talking about a, a spiritual reality. And so if you are one of those people who recognize, well, I, I know I'm not a Christian, I know I'm not a follower of Jesus, I don't know that I'm totally convinced I'm under the power of these evil forces. Uh, part of the effectiveness of these evil forces is that you don't think that you're under their power. That's part of this whole deception thing, this whole deceiving thing. And I can assure you, as one who was under that power and who has been brought out, and, and many others here have experienced this as well, um, once you are rescued from it, you become very much aware of what it was doing in your life and the power that you were under. And the good news is that for anybody who, 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 maybe you are conscious of it, you are conscious of this evil, 
working in your life and doing things you don't want to do and not being able to do the things you want to do. And there's a number of different ways this is manifested, fear and anxiety and so on. But if, you, if, you're, if you're aware of that and you want to be delivered to it, the Bible promises us that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, He hears those who call out to him from the darkness and he rescues and delivers them. And not because you've done something good and not because you've made yourself good. He actually comes to you in the midst of the deepest of your darkness and he bestows on you his, his favor, his grace. It's not deserved and he brings you out of darkness and into light and he begins a work of transformation in you that's, that is beautiful and wonderful and, um, and all are invited to receive that gift that he extends. So uh, the third thing we see about the enemy is that our enemy operates in the spiritual realm. That was what he says here, that these, uh, these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Um, there is a spiritual realm and there is a physical realm. And both of these are real. One of the things that, uh, one of the things that we experience as people who, were, who live in, 21st century North American culture is that uh, we have the benefit of living in a time of history where advances in medicine and technology and science have helped us to understand many of the mysteries of the universe and the human body and of this world. We, it, the, these advances has, have helped to demystify so many of the things that have perplexed humans throughout the ages and continue to perplex humans in many parts of the world today. This has been tremendously helpful. The downside is, is that we've come out of the, we've we've, we've so demystified things that many of us live in the world as though the only realities are material and physical. And so we always assume that there are physical causes to every thing that we see or experience in the world. And that's an error of a different sort. So on the one hand, we can over-spiritualize everything and see uh, the devil and spiritual reality behind every sneeze and, and every rock and every hard thing that we experience in the course of our day. And on the other hand, we can so uh, demystify the world or disenchant the world that, there's no, that there is no spiritual reality and we discount the reality of the spiritual realm. And the Bible corrects both errors. We, we don't want to be... Uh, magical in our, in our approach to the world, overly spiritual, but we also don't want to be overly material. We want to recognize there's a spiritual world, there's a physical world, and there's often a great deal of overlap between these two worlds. And we have to live cognizant of both of them. Um, one of the ways that the, the devil works most effectively is by uh, causing us not to is, is in this way of causing us not to believe in him. Uh, you may remember the movie, the, the Usual Suspects, if you saw it, and there's this fantastic line that is just imminently quotable when he says, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was to convince the world that he didn't exist. And uh, that's very much the way he works is to, and he's doing that very effectively in the developed world today. The, the, the undeveloped world doesn't believe at all. They know very much that the devil is present. Uh, but our issue at our time, is to not believe that he exists. Uh, Some of you have read the Screw Tape Letters. You may have been in Pastor James' class last year where he taught through this book. It's a brilliant book. But for those who aren't familiar with it, it's it's a series of letters between um, an advanced, mature demon named Screw Tape who's writing to his nephew, who's like a demon in training, called Wormwood. It's a strange concept, but it's very good. And one of the things that he's giving him advice on is to how, to how to cause the object of his temptation uh, not to believe that the devil and his demons are real and working. And so this is the advice he gives to the, to the younger demon. He says, the fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, he therefore cannot believe in you. Isn't that exactly how we think about the devil in our culture? He's red tights, he's got horns, he carries a pitchfork, he comes around on trick-or-treat, you see him. That's how we think about it. And so therefore, though, that's ridiculous. 
That's ridiculous. And so if we're discounting that false image of him, we end up discounting the reality of the fact that the devil is very much real and, and present. We have an enemy. And so are you cognizant of that fact? Are you aware that there is an enemy who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, and that the effects of his work and those in league with him is very much around you each day? And are you intentionally standing guard, keeping watch, standing firm, so that uh, when he's coming for you, when he's working in the world around you, that you're not taken in by his schemes? Well, what precisely are his schemes? That's the, the next thing we're going to look at here. The enemy uses schemes against us. He uses schemes against us. In other words, his most common uh, approach to dealing with people is not a direct frontal attack, but a scheming one. Look what he says in verse 11, going back one verse. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We're going to talk next week about what it means to put on the whole armor of God and what that armor actually is. This week we're going to talk about the schemes. And that word schemes is, is a, um, it comes from a Greek word that, we would most directly translate like methods, his strategies. What's his approach to causing people to fall? You see, the, the aim is that we would be able to stand. The devil's aim is to take us down, to cause us not to be able to stand. And so how does he go about causing people to fall? It's not primarily direct frontal attack. John Stott puts this helpfully. He says, it's because the devil seldom attacks openly, preferring darkness to light, that when he transforms himself into an angel of light, we are caught unsuspecting. He is a dangerous wolf, but he enters Christ's flock in the disguise of a sheep. Sometimes he roars like a lion, but more often he is as subtle as a serpent. We must not imagine, therefore, that open persecution and open temptation to sin are his only or even his commonest weapons. He prefers to seduce us into compromise and deceive us into error. So, for example, the very first temptation we see in the scripture, the Garden of Eden. He does not come at Adam and Eve and say, God is a liar. Instead, he says, did God really say? You see, the first is a direct attack. The first puts people on defense. The second, well, it's far more subtle and it's far more effective. And this is the way he more frequently works with us. Did God really say? Satan, well, one of the most helpful illustrations of this, I heard in a sermon that Tim Keller gave, and he was talking about spiritual warfare and how the devil works. And, he, said, and he, he gets this illustration from a book on counseling. And he said, if you were to go to a piano like this and you were to open it up and you were to sing into the piano, just sing a note, which I won't do. But if you were to do that, uh, one of the strings would vibrate to the sound of your voice. It would resonate with your voice, the particular note that you're singing. You may not know which note it is, but it knows. And he says, that's very much how the devil works in the life of people. He can't take good people and make them bad, but he can take flawed people and make them worse. And so what he does is he comes and he effectively sings to your heart and to your discorded strings, and he causes them to resonate. He sings those songs to you, those words to you that resonate with you. And you respond to them. So if you're a person, for example, that's given to anxiety... The devil knows that about you. And so what does he do? Well, he comes and sings the note of giving you all kinds of reasons to be fearful and to be anxious. And he, he amplifies that fallenness, that flawedness that's already in you through his attacks. You may be a person that's given to bitterness. So what does he do? Well, he comes along and he whispers to you and reminds you about the ways that you've been overlooked and and the ways that you've been mistreated and the ways that people have discounted you and not given you the respect that you deserved and so on. And he finds in you a, 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 a string that resonates with these words. And so, we, so we're subtly taken in by what he's doing. We're subtly taken in by his schemes. Uh, you know, as I was thinking about it this morning, I thought the devil works in many ways like these Russian bots are working uh, through social media in the United States. How do, they, how do they work? 
Well, they know that we have an inclination to discord right now. They know that we have a, an inclination to distrusting the other side and to, and to enmity with each other. So what do they do? Well, they create, they create videos, say, of people burning ballot boxes. Why? Because your heart already wants to go there. Your heart already wants to believe that the other side is up to something evil and they're up to something terrible. And so it, it strikes a chord with you and you resonate with it. And they, they did that so effectively through the last election. They did it through this election. The people got wise to it this time a little bit. And, and we resisted. They weren't able to wreak the same amount of havoc. But the devil works in a very similar way. He comes and he, he knows what you're already inclined toward. And what does he do? He subtly incites you and induces you. He comes to David. And, and what, does he, what does he do to David? He incites him. He says, David's going to be inclined to take pride in the size of his army. So what does he do? Well, he goes along and suggests that he take a census of his army. This is the way that he frequently works. Now, if you want to get into more details about how the devil and his schemes operate, there is a book that was written in the 1600s, and there's still not been a better one written on the subject. It's called uh, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. It was written by a Puritan named Thomas Brooks. And in this book, he lays out 30 to 40 um, devices that Satan uses to bring people down. And then he also provides some remedies for how you can resist these works of the devil. It's very practical. If you've never read Puritan, this is a great book to start with. It's very practical. And you will, some of the language is a little bit difficult, but you know, you will resonate with what he's saying because it's true. So let me just share with you three of the devices that he highlights and uh, just to give you an idea. So one way that the devil works, one of his schemes is that the enemy presents the bait but hides the hook. This is traditional temptation, right? This is temptation 101. Uh, it's how we catch fish. Here's a, here's a beautiful looking googly eyed, you know, lure and uh, the fish comes and takes hold of it because it looks attractive, doesn't notice the hook, and, but it's too late once it does, and so it's taken. And so this is the way temptation works with us. Satan presents something that's attractive to us. It's something good. We can go back to the Garden of Eden, and when they see the fruit, and it looks good for food, and it can make one wise. These are good things that they want, and what they don't see is the hook. And so they take it, and of course bring themselves and all of us into this estate of death and misery that, we, that we're in. So that's one of his first devices. Well, how does he suggest that we, you know, not get taken by this? Well, for one, he reminds us that, um, you know, if there's a pit and you don't want to fall into it, the best thing to do is to not get near the pit. And so we can think about the example of, uh, of Joseph and the example of David. Joseph and David experienced the same temptation, the same bait, we might say. Joseph runs away from the pit. David moves closer and falls into it. Uh, one way to deal with temptation is to run away from it. Uh, and he gives many other pieces of advice as well. The second, and we're kind of moving here from sort of lower level devices to increasingly complicated devices. So a second device he uses is that the enemy persuades us of extenuating factors that lessen the seriousness of sin. In short, what he's saying is um, the devil will suggest to you extenuating circumstances that make what you're about to do not seem as bad as what it is. You will say to yourself, for example, it's just a little dishonesty. <laughs> it's just a little indulging in my covetousness. It's just a little selfishness. It's just a little lust. It's just a little... It's not little. It's not little. And what he points out is that the least sin is contrary to the law of God, the nature of God, the being of God, and the glory of God, and therefore is often punished severely by God. The least sin. The least sin is enough to land us in hell. The least sin is an infinite offense against the glory of God. There are no extenuating circumstances when we're talking about sin. And so he says we need to be steadfast in that. We need to remember that. We need to remind ourselves when you're tempted to think, well, if I just engage this little sin, it may keep me from falling into the much larger sin. He says, that's, 
crazy. If you engage the little sin, you're opening the door to the, to the whole thing and you likely will fall into both. There are no extenuating circumstances when it comes to dealing with sin. Don't let the devil fool you. The third uh, device is this. The enemy causes us to remember our sins more than our Savior. You see, the devil can't snatch you out of the hand of Jesus. You belong to him. If you are in Christ, you are in Christ, and there's nothing in heaven on earth or under the earth. There's nothing in the future. There's nothing, in the past. there's nothing that can separate you from his love. If you're in Jesus, you're in Jesus. But what the devil can do is rob us of our joy in our salvation. What he can do is make us less effective in the ministries that he's called us to be engaged in in our day-to-day life. He can make us miserable. He can make us unfruitful. And one of the ways that he does that is by reminding you of your past failures, bringing them up to you, just subtly whispering in a quiet moment, maybe even as you're enjoying serving the Lord in some particular way, and the devil comes and says, you, really, don't you remember How could somebody like you? So this is how, this is one of the ways he works. And so what does Thomas Brooks tell us to do? He says, look to the Savior. When the devil keeps pointing you to your sin, you need to keep looking to the Savior, the one who's taken away all of your sins. He maybe has not yet delivered you from the presence of sin, but you can rest assured today, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Their sins have been forgiven. They are not counted against you. And they cannot separate you from his love anymore. God does not allow Satan to come to us to cause us to fall. But another Puritan, Samuel Rutherford, said, Satan is only God's master fencer to teach us to use our weapons. He's only God's master fencer to teach us to use our weapons, how to rely on Christ, how to draw upon the strength of Christ, how to discover the amazing riches and power that's available to us in him. This is why God allows the devil to come and to attack. The third thing we see in this passage is the fact that we have a strong defense. Verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Paul's bringing his whole of Ephesians to a conclusion. And you know, we've been looking at these glorious truths about God's rich salvation and, and his, how he's rescued us and, and brought us into the light that we can live a new life. And we've seen all the practical implications of what that life looks like in the home and at work and various other places. But now, as, as a sort of parting word... He wants us to understand that we do not go about living out this Christian life in a time of peace or on a practice field. We are in the midst of a war. And so he wants to encourage us that there is strength available to us for this fight. It's not going to be easy living out this Christian life, but there, you're not going about this in your own strength. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And when I read that, that phrase, be strong in the Lord, it immediately recalled to mind the fact that throughout the Old Testament, this is a command we see often repeated, to be strong. And it's frequently coupled with the words and courageous. Be strong and courageous. And one of the places that immediately come to mind when we think about that is the book of Joshua. And in Joshua chapter one, Joshua has just been newly raised up to follow after Moses as the leader of God's covenant people. And they are on the the plains of Moab about to enter into the land that God had promised to them. But when they cross into the land, they're not entering into a peaceful place. They're entering into a land filled with God's enemies. They're going to have to fight. And the enemy that they're going to have to fight is bigger, stronger, better trained, living in fortified cities. They've got everything in their favor. The people of God have been wandering around the desert for 40 years. So God says to Joshua three times in chapter one, be strong and courageous. Culminating with that well-known verse in Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 
Why does he tell him three times? Be strong and courageous. Because that's what he needs. Because the temptation is going to be fearful. The temptation is going to be to back down. The temptation is going to be to run. And so God says, don't do that. Be strong, courageous, push forward, enter into this conflict. And what's the confidence he has in the midst of the conflict? I'm with you. I'm with you. The source of your courage and strength is not that you've got a great army. You don't. It's not that you've got great weapons. You don't. You've got me. And that's enough. Now, what's beautiful is that we come to the New Testament and we're not engaging in a military conflict like Joshua was, but we're entering into a conflict that's just as real and even more deadly. And what does he say to us through the Apostle Paul? Be strong. Where's the source of the strength with which we can be strong to face the enemies and to engage in the fight that we're about to engage in? It's not in you. It's in me. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. As surely as the Lord was with Joshua, so he will be with us in the conflicts that we are facing. In just a couple of weeks, we're going to start an Advent series on the book of Isaiah. And it's in the book of Isaiah where we discover this amazing word, one word in Hebrew, Emmanuel, which means God with us. And God was promising his people that that he was going to send someone whose name would be Emmanuel, who would be God with us. And we know that that person is Jesus. And Jesus was very literally with his people in the first century, but then he ascended into heaven. And so some folks might say, well, how can God be with us? He's in heaven. Well, after Jesus ascended into heaven, he did what he promised, and that is he sent his Holy Spirit upon his church. And the Spirit dwells in the heart of every believer. We are the temple in which God resides. He is with his people now more than ever. Therefore, as we face this battle, we do so knowing even more than Joshua could have known. We can be strong and courageous. We can stand firm. Why? Because God is with us. If you are in Jesus, then Jesus is very much in you by his spirit. So we're in a conflict. We have an enemy. And Martin Luther was very cognizant of the enemy that we faced. He was very cognizant of the devil and the way he seeked to work. And he wrote that famous hymn we talked about a couple of weeks ago, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And, and one of the lines in that hymn says, For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. You sing that verse and it's kind of depressing because he is strong. He is crafty. There is nobody who can stand toe to toe with the devil on this earth. But then he gets to the next verse and he sings, did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies is his name from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And he's in you and he's in me. And so brothers and sisters, because of that, we can be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We can stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And next week we'll figure what does it mean then to take up the whole armor of God and to actively engage this fight? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have not left us alone in this world to reap the consequences of our rebellion and disobedience, but that you came to rescue your people, that you interposed the precious blood of Jesus to take away every sin, to disarm the rulers and authorities with their list of accusations against us, and you nailed them to the cross so that we can stand forgiven no longer under Satan's power. For those still under that power this morning, I pray that you will deliver them. I pray that they'll call upon your name this morning, even now, and that you will save them. And for us who have been saved, would you help us to stand firm in the strength of your might and your mighty power and to encourage one another in this battle. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.